Hey, welcome to my hike. I'm Kevin and um, congratulations, first of all, for getting up this early and putting on your hiking shoes and finding a nice comfortable chair to sit down and watch some exercise in. Good for you. Um, this is a great trail. We're under the observatory, as you can see behind me. I mean, come on. Come on, am I right? <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if some of the movie stars from the 30s and 40s used to hike up here. You know, like Clark Gable or Humphrey Bogart or Betty Davis, any of them. And then I started thinking, probably not. Because, you know, they were out partying late at night, probably hungover, uh, much like maybe you are this morning, but not me. So enjoy your exercise from wherever it is and uh, let's go for a hike come on come on whoa <laughs> whoa whoa hiking alongside me today is someone that i haven't spent that much time with lately i first met him uh when he was a writer on saturday night live it was back in the 1900s but there was a lot of writers on snl that were also aspiring performers but they took the job because it was a great job. And uh, he went on to become a performer and a great one. And you may know him from his work on Mr. Show. He co-created that with David Cross. You know him from his work on Breaking Bad. And most currently you know him from that crazy hit show, Better Call Saul. That's right. We're hiking alongside the very talented, the very funny Mr. Bob Odenkirk. Hey, Bob. Hey, Kevin, how's it going? Good. Did you wash your hands? Uh, no, I never wash my hands because you get some really good, uh, what is it called for your gut, the floral? Oh, you, you the, build up your immunity the to immunity, bacteria? Yeah, you let, go to any porta potty. Forget yogurt. Yogurt's the old man's way. What if you wash your hands with yogurt? I can't think of anything more gross than being shoved down into the hole of the porta potty. Yeah, that's the worst thing. Uh, interesting the nazis never thought of that caught, yeah maybe, maybe that's what thought. water torture is really interesting a water torture works with clear clean water it still drives you crazy yeah you know like i wonder if it would double the time on water torture if you used porta potty liquid <laughs> probably if that would like save time every war would have ended like <laughs> within a week <laughs> I love to dunk cookies and milk. Uh -huh, Are you right. a, a, a dunker when it comes to cookies? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm good at it. I can't eat a lot of cookies, though. You dunk them for other Too people? Too much sugar. Yes. I... It's like making s'mores for other people? Yes, I have a service. Uh, <laughs> well, you use gloves? We you drive do? to... No, you come right from the no porta potty, oh, grab the cookies, <laughs> and get some good floral bacteria in people's system. You get just the right amount of milk in there so it doesn't break off. Yeah. And it's able to sustain right. Right. Uh, it carries wholeness the milk, to get to the mouth. And yet it maintains its integrity. You would be you a good, want the cookie to maintain its integrity. You would be a good water torturer, but with milk. Yeah. Because you know just how long to leave it in there. Right, right. I just want to compliment you on the Gary Shandling documentary that you're in. That is so wonderful. Thanks, Bob. That uh, I think deserves an Oscar. Wow. Judd's first Oscar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a wonderful piece of, uh, of work and a real great way to learn about a, another person and a very interesting person. It's, it's so comprehensive and it's just great. It's beautiful. Yeah, and, I, think, uh, I think the viewers could learn a lot about a lot of things in that. If you're a stand-up comic or you're yeah. interested in doing stand-up comedy, yeah. if you're interested in about living kind of a, a, you know, a more whole life, being yeah. in the moment, you know, there's some Buddhism philosophies and, and just yeah. in general, just a lot about relationships with different people. I think sometimes when you see biographies and they're short, there's just no way around it but to do shortcuts and, and you only get a taste of a person's struggle. With this one, with Gary, I feel like you get very close to a real person, a three-dimensional person, and you feel, I gotta say, how he struggled. It wasn't some you know, now he's famous and life is good, or it was like he, all through his life were these uh, challenges of uh, that he had, was asking himself about how to be authentic and be a, you know, what can I contribute to the world every day? And it, it was just, it ran through his whole life. And it wasn't some simple thing that he 
learned a simple lesson and moved on. <clears throat> yeah. Because I think that's more like real life, you know? It is life. It's always changing and you're always having to adjust and evolve. And you never really just find anything out. <laughs> no, ultimately, no. <laughs> you never figure anything out completely. But, you know, I, I've tried keeping journals before. Yeah. But it didn't last long, you know? Uh -huh. It'd go, like, for the vacation. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and then I would, like, so I have a lot but of I journals. I that's fine. Yeah, but I have a lot of journals, yeah. like, you know, those... Uh, composition books yeah. that are filled with like three pages in each sure. one you know they really are just therapy they don't really need to be capped or there's no responsibility to it except to poop out your thoughts yeah. on the page and see yeah. what happens Get i think them, keep I them think, circling around in your head too much true i think journals are uh great for single people yeah they have time to do it when you're married right. You don't have time to keep a journal. Yeah, can you imagine telling your wife you're journaling and that's why you can't help? You can't pick up the kids. Honey, I'm journaling. I'm writing about why I don't want to pick up the kids. <laughs> Bob, I met you for the first time, I think, in New York City, wasn't it? When sure, you were on yeah, Saturday Night Live as a writer? I was in Chicago writing comedy and doing radio shows and, and then doing stand-up because of the stand-up boom. Does anyone yeah. remember the stand-up boom out there? <laughs> It Kevin went bust. does. It, it was bust. nuts. It was crazy. Well, it needed to go bust because it was crazy. It needs to reinvent itself again. Yes. You wrote on SNL for uh -huh. six years? No, only four. Four years. Not long. And, and I, I, I think the biggest thing I wrote was a motivational speaker, but that didn't come on until I had left the show. Matt I wrote Foley. it at yeah. Second City. Really? For Chris. Yeah. So that was pre-written already. Well, we, yeah, I wrote it. But at, I've been at SNL for three years when I went and did Second City in the summer. Yeah. It was a weird thing, Kevin. I was leaving, only Smigel knows this. I would leave Wednesday after the read-through and fly to Chicago and do the improv set at night and then do Thursday night set and Friday night set. And then I would fly back for SNL. And because I wasn't a very effective writer. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, I wasn't that important. I thought you were like one of the big writers no, there. No, no, Dana Carvey loved you. Well, no I one else Dana, really, but, but Dana, that didn't yeah. make me meaningful. So you uh, were, you were so definitely I was, I was an flying. aspiring performer. You wanted to perform. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, when I left, I called Lorne, which uh, just yet another... Prank call? Yeah, I accidentally <laughs> called him. I was just recalling random numbers. <laughs> there was no pocket dials back then. Yeah. It was just pocket pool. <laughs> <laughs> which people have gotten so bad at. Um, Remember how good practice. you were at pocket yeah. pool? Yeah. And now with the camera and the phone as a distraction? <laughs> That's right. No one's practicing their pocket pool. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the pocket pool. Sorry, man. I was just playing pocket pool. I didn't mean to bump into you. <laughs> so you, you went back and forth to Chicago. I didn't even I know did that. I did for the last half of that season. And, and I wrote the motivational speaker. Yeah. For Chris, he had done a, a sort of song. He'd done a version of the Matt Foley character, a couple lines and a sketch, an improv we did. And I just had this notion for this guy's story and how to use it. And, and, and so that came on after I left SNL. I left, I called Lauren, I said, I felt so weird and embarrassed to say, you know, I, I like performing. I told him, I said, I gotta leave because I wanna perform. And, I know I'm not good enough to move into the show in any capacity, really. Uh, and so, you know, he was great. He was like, he, he said, I get it. You know, I mean, Lorne performed when he started. And he still likes to perform, no matter what he says. And you were hoping that maybe he would say, uh, nothing. Bob. Nothing. I just you... wanted him to not be bothered by me. I felt like I was nothing but a bother at that show. Oh, man. I Everybody really did. I know way. in the last year I became more effective and I was able to help Sandler and Rock and all those guys. You were more effective after you left than when you were there. I was. <laughs> Here's the thing. I, it's not like I was dying to become an actor or something. I just wanted the option of being able to perform my own stuff. And I knew that wouldn't happen at SNL. And I also was just kind of not really a company man. You know what I mean? Yeah. A bit of more of a prickly pear. You were what they describe uh, serial killers as a loner type. That's right. A loner. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> It was a tough gig for me. Yeah. Anyway. That's me.
you shoot um, Better Call Saul? Better Call Saul, we're fourth season. We're Man. on episode seven. That's it's great. going really well. And You're great in it, It's very exciting. It's very yeah. fun to be a part of a Can you believe that? well-written story. Can you call I said, no, I can't believe it. That time and said, hey, I'm leaving. I want to be a performer. Yeah. And now, <laughs> cut to 25 years later, right. you are. <laughs> you have your own show. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah drama. <laughs> a one-hour drama. It's a drama. Who would have thought? And you in Nebraska was great, too. Oh, thanks, buddy. Um, Alexander You Fain. know, I, I, I got to tell you, though, this is going to sound weird, or maybe you'll understand it. I was on stage with Chris Farley and Jill Talley at Second City back when this time that we were talking about, yeah. the third season of SNL for me. And... We were improvising, and I look out at the audience, and we're getting good laughs. It's a funny little kind of physical thing. I don't even remember what it was, but, uh, and I had the crazy thought in the back of my head, you should be in drama. <laughs> yeah. I had a thought that if I was sitting in that audience watching these three performers, that guy, these guys are great in comedy, fun, pure, joyful, and that guy, He's a little bit, I don't know what he's up to. <laughs> a little dark, a little bit a little of a loner. A little bit of darkness in there. And that belongs in a dramatic environment. And so it was a weird, you know, thought came from nowhere, just really registered with me. Yeah. But I never pursued it, you know, Kevin. I never, How I never you... told my agents, get me dramas or yeah. uh, audition. I didn't even hardly audition for anything anyways. I, I wrote my own stuff. Well, how did you roll in Breaking Bad? Boy, I'll about? tell you. Hey man, if I'd shown up there and been told, oh my God, you are not who we thought you were. <laughs> I would have gone, oh, of course, I figured that. Peter said, Peter Gould, who uh, created the character in the, in the episode uh, and wrote that first episode, Peter said, there was something about that first scene I did in the interrogation room where I guess he said there were some pauses in there and things that made us think, hmm, this guy, this guy's got a lot going on in his head. And, and do you? Oh, no, no. <laughs> no, that's why I'm a good actor, buddy. <laughs> I think they like, too, the comedy that it brought to the show. The show was so bleak. Yeah. At a certain point, pretty much every main character was dying <laughs> yeah. or going to die any second. Uh -huh. And I think Saul was this guy who was arm's length from the danger and just having a having a good old time. You have a family now. You've got yeah. two kids. Yeah, they're Your older. wife is a manager. How do you like being a dad? Because I know you weren't that happy with your dad, right? No, my dad was uh, basically not around. And also when he was around, he was uh, difficult and distant and I never really connected with this guy. I, it was a, it Did was, you know his name? Yeah. Started with a W. Okay. But uh, it was a weird thing, you know, and, and he left when I was about 14. And then I got to see him again when I was 22. Uh, he was dying and I got to see him and talk to him a couple times. And I really walked in there thinking, this is great. I didn't like him. We didn't connect, but maybe it was me. I was a young teenager and I'm only child? a difficult person. No, no, seven kids. I thought I will, I will see if I can connect with them. I'll really make an effort, you know, yeah. conscious effort to try to, and it didn't happen. And I got to see him probably five or seven times and, and it never, I was like, great. When I walked away, it was like, we were never going to connect. Nothing, nobody fucked up. No. So you had closure in a way. Yes, I did because yeah. it was just never going to happen. It didn't matter. What about the rest of your siblings? Did they? You know, they got to see him before he died. So I think that meant a lot to them, especially the little kids. I think yeah. it helped them a lot that they got to hang out with him a bit. So now uh, you're being a dad. You're trying to correct all that, right? Oh, and yeah. Not... And overcompensating by being this term that is gross called helicopter parent. But, yeah, you right. know, I really was all over my kids lives uh until they finally really went just please just leave me alone <laughs> uh, i still am uh always checking on them and you worry about to know them a lot you know i worry about them a lot but i think it matters to let a kid know just that you give a shit that you know like somebody cares there's a thing i think in life where when you're faced with uh questionable moments in life yeah 
uh, and and you know whether it's some risk you're going to take or they're at a party and they're going to make a choice that feeling of like well i know there's at least one person who is going to hear about this or know want to know about it there's yeah. somebody who's keeping track cares it matters a lot i think it helps you to make a better choice but uh having said that i think my kids are now 17 and 19 and they're very independent people and i it's been nice to be well, to be disinvited <laughs> yeah. from their lives. They're and, independent. And I'm trying to, trying to, I'm trying to honor that in the best way. Do you um, do you do stand up comedy still or perform? Not really. Um, I like I'm doing a charity event next weekend, yeah. and I'll write some jokes for it and stuff. But there's. Does it you make know, you nervous I, getting up to do stand up? No, it should. But it doesn't. <laughs> no, I, I'm so I, bad. It should make me really nervous. <laughs> uh, I think. Uh, Stand-up for me has always been just a use of my writing um, brain and my writing ability. I don't know what I'm doing up there. It's funny because I tried to copy you. I think I might have told you this, Kevin. I don't think so. I never told you this? No. When I went to SNL, you know, it was so hard for me when I started there as a writer. So hard. I just... nerve-wracking. Oh, the pressure's insane. And, and I just felt not like I was fairly ineffective and not helpful and yeah. and I and so to go do the improv which I did like on Sunday nights was a chance to just get a couple of laughs and go oh I wrote that it yeah. got laughs I, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm funny I'm yeah once in a while and uh, besides for it was fun to see Larry David yell at the audience that's right even when they liked him <laughs> I know <laughs> I remember one time watching him they were liking him and he started telling them they sucked and they were terrible and I thought well, be, that's the only ending what, he had what did I miss he's so used to people getting angry he goes what else am I going to do somebody didn't tell him you know you can leave the stage when you're done you don't have to alien you don't have to chase them away God. do you see David Cross anymore oh yeah you guys still uh, buddies yeah 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 that was David. great, Mr. Show. Oh, yeah. Thank you, buddy. We did a little reunion-type show at Netflix called uh, With Bob and David, and we want to do more of those. That would be awesome. Uh, we had so much sense. fun, and uh, we still love to work together. It's just that he lives in New York, and I live here, and he... And he's got a kid now, right? He's got a kid, and it's a beautiful girl, and she's he's starting to realize how much fun kids are, and uh, I think he's realizing, like, oh, I don't want to work that much. I want to watch this little... Yeah. Bean grow up because she's hilarious and wonderful. Does the little girl have a beard and a shaved head? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bob Odenkirk. Man, it was good to see him again. I haven't seen him in a long time because he's so busy. It was fun. I learned some things I didn't know about Bob. Thanks for joining my hike. Please turn on notifications and uh, subscribe to my channel. And um, we will catch you the next time. <laughs>